so you're thinking about getting into Super 8 filmmaking. Hey, my name is Matt Johnson, and I'm here to help you out with that. Today we're going to be getting super practical, and I'm going to be sharing with you everything you need to know to start filming in Super 8. We're going to cover what cameras you should consider buying and the most important feature of any Super 8 camera that you buy. Then we've got film stocks to talk about, including what you should use outside in the bright sun and at night when it's really dark. And then we need to talk about where you should have your film processed, who should scan it, and we'll wrap everything up by talking about the overall price that you can expect to spend for all of this. There are chapters down below if you want to skip ahead, but if you're thinking, dang, Matt, this is a long video, you wouldn't be wrong. So to help you out, I've put together a Super 8 filming cheat sheet that's going to walk you through with links to cameras and film stocks that I recommend, where to send off your film to be processed and scanned, plus any little other tidbits and factoids that you need to know. It's completely free. If you want to download the guide, I will link to it down below in the video description. Moving on then, let's now get technical and talk about the tools and equipment that you need to film in Super 8. First off, most obviously, you need a camera. And the good news is that if you don't have one, there's a pretty good chance that one of your relatives may have one. Super 8 cameras were very popular in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Millions of them were sold, and once film fell out of popularity and digital took over, most of these cameras were put into the attic or other storage and promptly forgotten about. So ask around. Odds are your parents or grandparents will probably have a lead on one, or you'll end up like me, where my uncle keeps telling me that he knows he has one somewhere, but he's never been able to find it. Uncle Greg, still waiting, still holding out. Eventually, okay. <laughs> Suffice to say, this is definitely the cheapest option because one of your family members will most likely be willing to give you a camera for free. But if that doesn't work out and you're willing to spend some cash, your next cheapest option after free would be to begin visiting eBay, Craigslist, maybe a flea market or an antique store, any place that sells old stuff that people don't use anymore. Odds are you should be able to get a Super 8 camera for very cheap, but here comes the con of doing things this way. Namely, just because someone's selling an old Super 8 camera, that doesn't mean that it actually works. The batteries could have corroded, the motor that runs the film could be broken, there's any number of issues that could have occurred, so you're kind of taking a gamble. Because of that, I would recommend looking for listings that say the camera is actually tested and working. You'll most likely end up paying more for a camera that's verified to work, but this can help. As a warning though, even if a person says that a camera's working, that means they probably just put batteries in it and held down the shutter button. Not that they actually filmed something with it and sent it off to be processed to guarantee that the camera was working properly. So, even if the listing says that a Super 8 camera is tested and working, it may be in your best interest to reach out to the seller and ask how they tested it. Now, let's get more expensive. If you're wanting to guarantee that you're buying a Super 8 camera that works, I have two options for you. The first option is to buy a Super 8 camera that has been refurbished from a company called Pro 8mm. They're one of the bigger companies in the Super 8 filmmaking space, and they offer several different models to choose from, ranging in price from $700 to a rather eye-watering $3,600. This is potentially hundreds to thousands of dollars more than you would be spending for an equivalent camera on eBay, but what you're spending extra for in this scenario is a camera that is guaranteed to be working. Lastly, I have one other option for you, and spoiler, this is the option that I chose. Your last option for buying a Super 8 camera is to actually check Etsy. Yes, the website that's more commonly known for selling handmade sweaters and knickknacks also surprisingly sells Super 8 cameras. There are a lot of sellers on the site, but I bought my Super 8 camera from a guy named Monster Flips USA for 450 bucks. This guy refurbishes a wide range of Super 8 cameras at varying price points, so depending on your price range, you should hopefully be able to find something that'll work for you. In the end, I ended up buying my camera on Etsy instead of going to Pro 8mm because the price was dramatically cheaper. But, 
whenever you're considering where to buy a camera, there is a very important technical factor that you need to take into consideration. See, while Super 8 cameras are all very similar and that they all take the same kind of film, one of the most important parts of them is whether they have a working internal light meter and how it is powered. This light meter is gonna tell the camera how bright whatever the subject is the camera is filming and then adjust the aperture of the lens to compensate for that brightness. And believe me, if there's one thing you want with a Super 8 camera, you want a camera with a working light meter. You know how whenever you're filming with a digital camera like an A7S III and you look at the back of your camera screen and you can see if the image is overexposed and then adjust your aperture to compensate? Well, imagine doing that, but not having a viewfinder to actually know if your camera is overexposed or not. That would suck. And if you don't invest in a Super 8 camera with a working light meter, and if your camera will even let you adjust your aperture manually, you're going to be needing to purchase a standalone light meter that you can then use to measure the ambient light of whatever you're filming and then change the aperture of your camera accordingly. This can be super time consuming and it's really the antithesis of what Super 8 filmmaking is in that it was created to be a very user-friendly format. This is the camera that anybody's grandmother could pick up, hold down the shutter button and begin recording video. If you hand grandma an external light meter, She's not gonna know what to do. So you need to invest in a Super 8 camera with a working light meter. And one of the most important factors to make sure it's working is what kind of batteries it takes. With some cameras, the camera requires a separate battery to power the light meter, and these are oftentimes a completely different type of battery. So before you buy any Super 8 camera, make sure you look at what kind of batteries it takes and if it requires batteries for its light meter. To wrap up this talk about cameras now, you've probably noticed at this point that I've not told you explicitly which which Super 8 camera to buy. And the reason I haven't told you is that it really doesn't matter. As long as you can buy a Super 8 camera that works and has a working light meter, you should be good to go. There are a lot of different brands and models and collectors and enthusiasts will tell you, oh, you have to purchase this super fancy model like a Braun Niso, which is honestly, yes, a very beautiful camera, but it really doesn't matter because at the end of the day, all these cameras will be recording on the same Super 8 film stocks. I will be sure to list some of the Super 8 cameras that I recommend in my Super 8 filming cheat sheet, which you can still download below. Now, this mention of film stocks does lead us into talking about film. And it's really easy to get overwhelmed with film really quickly because you start hearing words like Ektachrome, Vision, and Tri-X. What does all this mean? Here's the good news. You do not need to stress out about most of this because unless you wanna get super enthusiast with things and start buying expired film stocks, if you just wanna have fun filming in Super 8, there are really only three films that I would consider. And the choice of which one of these three you should use will be made by what you are filming. The three film stocks you need to know about are all made by Kodak and they are 50D, 200T, and 500T. What do all these numbers and D's and T's mean, Matt? Numbers first. You know how whenever you're filming with a digital camera and you can change the ISO to brighten up the image that you're filming? Now, look at this Super 8 camera. Do you see an ISO button anywhere? Spoiler, there isn't one. Because the ISO that you choose to film in is actually set by the film itself. That 50, 200, and 500 number on the film is an indicator of what ISO that film will record at. 50 is 50 ISO, 200 is 200 ISO, and 500 is 500 ISO. Quite a bit lower than the ISO 400,000 that my A7S III can hit, but this is what you have to work with. Now, what about the D and the T? Well, Think about a digital camera and how you have to set the white balance of the camera to tell the camera what color of light is recording. Incidentally, I have another video explaining white balance that I will link to in the corner and in the video description if you're not super clear on that. So, if you have to set your white balance on a digital camera, looking again at the Super 8 camera now, just like how there wasn't an ISO button, there isn't a white balance button either. The white balance is also handled by the film. In this case, the D in the 50D film stock stands for daylight, meaning that this film is recording at ISO 50 and is balanced for daylight color, meaning this film lends itself very well if you're filming outdoors on a bright and sunny day. Now, what about the T in 200T and 500T? 
This T stands for tungsten, and if you've ever messed with white balance, that term should be very familiar to you because tungsten lighting is your typical warm indoor lighting. And notice that for tungsten, you have the option of either recording with 200T film stock or 500T film stock. Because indoor tungsten lighting is usually significantly darker than bright outdoor sunlight, it makes sense that these film stocks should offer a higher ISO rating of 200 or 500. Now, let me make choosing a film stock really easy for you, because here's how I think about it. If you're not sure which film stock you should choose to put in your camera and record with, first ask yourself, am I indoors or outdoors? If you're outdoors, grab your 50D film stock, put it in your camera, and start recording. If you're indoors, on the other hand, the choice is a little more complex. First, you should definitely choose one of the T film stocks, but should you choose 200T or 500T? Well, in my experience, indoors is usually darker than I think it is, and I found that 500T can really help keep things bright enough, so in most situations, I would go for 500T. Now, what happens if you're filming indoors and suddenly realize you need to go outdoors and film something? Do you take your film out and swap it for another film stock? Well, you should be able to do this, but I do want you to be aware that you will lose several seconds of recording time because that little sliver of film will then be overexposed whenever you open up your camera. And also, depending on your camera, you may not even need to swap out your film stock at all whenever you go from indoors to outdoors or vice versa. Many Super 8 cameras, mine included, include a switch here on the side that toggles between a sun and a light bulb. The sun stands for daylight white balance and the light bulb stands for tungsten white balance. And what this switch does is that it will let you toggle a filter inside the camera that will help change the white balance of the light as it hits your film. So if your camera has 200T tungsten film inside it, but you need to go outside, you can flip this switch from the light bulb to the sun and that will engage a filter that will enable your tungsten film to then be used outdoors in daylight without the colors looking weird. Lastly, in regards to film, there's another way Super 8 is different than digital shooting, and that way is how much time you have to record. Unlike a memory card that can potentially record for hours, and then you can copy the footage and format it to reuse, film stocks on the other hand are a one-time use with significantly less recording time. How much less? How does three minutes sound? Yes, these film stocks are 50 feet long each, and recording at the Super 8 default of 18 frames per second will give you approximately three minutes of recording time before the film is used up and you need to switch it out for a new reel. This means that you need to be selective when shooting. No pressing record and waiting for something cool to happen. You need to be intentional and plan your shots ahead of time before you start recording. Now, with the film stock options out of the way, where should you buy your film? Well, the first thing you need to know is that film, like a gallon of milk, has a shelf life, meaning that you ideally want new film. And if you buy old film, there's a chance it will be deteriorated and the colors and exposure it records will not be correct. There is some cool stuff that you can do with older film because it can make some really cool colors and effects, but for the sake of this video, we're not going to get into that. You want to buy new film. And you have a few options for where you can buy it from. I will link to them down below. But for me, I typically buy from B&H and I keep it in a refrigerator until I'm ready to use it. I told you, it's like milk. And keeping it cold can help keep your film from deteriorating. All right, at this point, you have a camera and you have film and let's pretend that you took it to a wedding and filmed some really beautiful shots of the couple with it. Or at least, you hope you did. You held down the button and the camera made a sound, but you have no way of knowing at this point if it actually turned out or not. So what comes next? Well, there are actually two steps remaining. The first step is that you need to have your film processed. This is where you ship it off to a company that will use a vat of chemicals and science and maybe magic to develop your film and put it onto a reel that looks like this. Now there are several companies out there that will process Super 8 film today, and some of them, like Pro 8 Millimeter, will even sell you film with processing included, meaning that you buy the film from them, you shoot with it, and then you ship the film back to them where they will process it for no extra cost. This can be very appealing. 
But for me, I opted to be a bit more complicated because I wanted to save a lot of money. So I went with a company called Spectra Film and Video. Sending your roll of Super 8 film to Spectra is as easy as visiting their admittedly dated website, typing in all of your info, as well as how much film you're sending them, printing out this paper with all your info, and boxing it up with your film and shipping it off to them in California. Once it arrives, within a week or two, they will process the film, and if they were to ship it back to you at this point, it would look like an old reel of film. If you had an old school reel-to-reel -reel Super 8 projector, you could play it back and watch it, and while this sounds cool, this isn't really what you want. You want to be able to put this film onto your computer somehow so you can edit it in a traditional video editing program. So we've made it to the last step in the journey that your film needs to take. We've made it to the point where your film needs to be scanned in so you can watch and play it back on your computer. Just like with processing, Pro 8mm offers this, Spectra Film and Video also offers this, but in my case, I opted to go with a much smaller company to scan my film. In this case, it's a guy named Nicholas Coyle out of Colorado, and I have two reasons why I chose to go with him over these other two larger companies. The first reason is that he is incredibly knowledgeable and also very responsive, and he helped educate me on a lot of aspects of Super 8 that I didn't understand, many of which I'm telling you about in this video, so thanks for that, Nick. <laughs> but also, Nick also owns one of the highest quality film scanners that you can buy on the market today. It's super specialized, super fancy, but what matters the most to me, and what should matter to you, is that this scanner can scan in film at up to 6.5K resolution, meaning that if you want the absolute highest quality scans that you can get of your Super 8 footage, Nick has the tool to help you do that. So, whenever Spectra is done processing the film, I put Nick's address in the return field for the film, meaning that once Spectra's done, they immediately send the film to Nick. He then takes a couple days to scan the film in super high quality, and then he sends me a download link to an absurdly high resolution 5120 by 3840 ProRes 4444 video file that looks incredible. It's like 50 gigs for one three minute video file. It's amazing. And whenever I looked into having my film scanned from Spectra or Pro 8 Millimeter, I wasn't nearly as impressed by the scanning options from one or the price from the other. In Spectra's case, they will scan it up to 4K, but their pricing is kind of opaque because you're paying for at least half an hour of their scanning time, which is 262 bucks or they offer a 1080p scan for $49.50, but it's a 24 FPS instead of 18, and it's just not very customizable. Pro 8mm, on the other hand, does offer higher resolution scanning options up to 6.5K, but they charge significantly more than NIC. We're talking anywhere from $120 if you send them a hard drive to an eye-watering $530 if you want them to give you a download link to your video files. Compare that to Nick. How much does Nick charge for a 5K scan with a download link? 20 bucks. See why I like him? <laughs> this process of having Nick scan footage is pretty user friendly, but like I said, if you ever have any questions, he's only an email away. He will give you several options whenever it comes time for you to have your film scanned, and I wanna share with you what I typically choose when I have my film scanned. First, as I said earlier, I want my films to be scanned in very high resolution. In this case, Nick will scan it and I receive a 5120 by 3840 resolution video file. This way the footage looks great when I pair it with the other 4K footage that I shot with my digital cameras. Next, you'll have the option of whether you want your footage to be colored or scanned in flat for you to color it yourself. This is very much like shooting in a log picture profile versus shooting with a picture profile that has a baked in look. I would always recommend choosing a flat scan option so you can adjust the colors yourself. And as a plus, it's also cheaper because Nick's going to charge you to color your video otherwise. Lastly, and most importantly, you'll have the option to choose whether you want your scan to be cropped or not. Remember that Super 8 film is recorded in the 4x3 aspect ratio, but typically whenever we watch videos these days, they're in the 16x9 widescreen aspect ratio, 
TikTok and Instagram Reels excluded. Here you can choose to have your film cropped from that four by three aspect ratio down to 16 by nine, but I really do not recommend it. And instead, I recommend that you select an option called overscan, meaning that not only is the film strip recorded, but you can also see the edges of the film strip, as well as the sprocket holes that your camera uses to run the film strip through the camera. If we're talking cool retro looks, this is absolutely the coolest option, and the one that I highly recommend. Because if you get your film cropped, you're not gonna get to see all the cool edges of your video that really help give it that old school look. Otherwise, that's about it for scanning. The last thing that I want to talk about is price, because Super 8 filmmaking, while very cool, also happens to not be very cheap. Basically, every single step of filmmaking that you may take for granted as not costing you any money when you're shooting in digital has a cost associated with it whenever you're filming in Super 8. Need film? You're going to pay for it. Processing? Pay again. Scanning? Pay again. And don't forget, you need to pay for shipping between all of these steps. So now that I've scared you about the price, let's talk about what you can expect to pay as well as some of the ways you can save money. First, you need to buy your film. And as I said earlier, I usually recommend buying from B&H so you can guarantee that you're getting fresh film that isn't expired. This is going to run you about 40 bucks per reel. Now let's ship it to Spectra. So there's another $10 or so, depending on where you're located. It may be less if you use the Postal Service, it may be more if you use UPS or FedEx. Spectra is going to process the film for $25 per roll, and then they'll charge you for that, plus $5 or more for the shipping to Nick Coyle for scanning. Lastly, Nick will charge you $20 for scanning, and part of his cost includes the cost of shipping the processed film back to you. So in total, from you buying one reel of film stock to you having it processed, scanned, and shipped everywhere in between, you're looking at spending a grand total of around $100. That's 100 bucks for a three minute video clip. Dang, nobody said retro was cheap. This is also really making me appreciate the modern marvel that is digital cameras and how we can just throw a memory card in, record something, format it, then record again. I need you to be mentally prepared to spend some money if you wanna film Super 8. But that said, if you want to save some money, here are some options for how to do it. First, if you want to save on shipping, it's in your best interest to ship multiple reels of film at a time. So I wouldn't just shoot one reel of film then ship it off. Instead, I would try to shoot a few reels then send them off in a batch so you can save on shipping costs. Next, I also want you to be aware that Spectra does sell rolls of Super 8 film for $35 instead of the $40 that B&H charges, and Spectra has an option where you can buy the film from them and get discounted film processing as well. The only thing you need to keep in mind is that Spectra is going to charge you for shipping, whereas B&H usually does not, so this may not save you quite as much money as you think. Regardless, this could help you shave some of the cost off. And with that, that's how you can get started filming in Super 8. I really hope this video has been helpful to you. If you have not downloaded the Super 8 cheat sheet yet, it summarizes everything I've talked about here with links and it's completely free, it's linked down below. Also linked down below, you will find a link to this video's sponsor, Music bed. If you film weddings like me, I'm sure you need to license music for your films. And one of my favorite places to license music is Music Bed. I've been using Music Bed basically since I started filming weddings, and in my opinion, they have some of the best music from real bands with real emotion. If you want examples, I'm excited to tell you that you've already heard some, because every single song that I've used in this video is licensed from Music Bed. With over 700 indie artists and composers offering record label quality music that covers a huge range of styles and genres, you're basically guaranteed to find something that matches the vibe that you want in your film. They've got artists like The Walters, whose song is currently trending on TikTok. But I love Prince of Spain with a softer romantic vibe. and Kaylee Rutledge offering chill indie pop. There's just so much good music that isn't hard to find because their search tool has so many advanced features and they update their curated playlists all the time.
So it's really easy to find new songs that not everyone has used yet. Plus, when you sign up for a Musicbed subscription, you get unlimited downloads of high quality songs to use in your films. Oh, and they created a system called Sync ID, which automatically removes YouTube copyright claims for any music that you license through them using your subscription. All these songs that I've been playing in this video, no copyright claims. You and your couples won't have to deal with music copyright issues on YouTube, and that's amazing. Sound cool? Okay, use the link down in the description below to sign up, and use the coupon code MATTMUSICBED. All one word, all caps, very difficult to misspell, and you will get your first month of an annual wedding subscription for free. That's 12 months for the price of 11 to license unlimited music. So, special thanks to Musicbed. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed the fun of filming in Super 8, and have a great day.